from downtown Milwaukee, welcome to Money Talk with Bob Landis. Each week, professional advisors from Landis and Company Investments discuss the latest financial developments, offering timely insight and long-term perspective. Welcome to Money Talk for February 2nd, 2024. It's Groundhog Day, and we're going to keep doing this until we get it right. Here, let's check it. Your Milwaukee Bucks are on the road this week with stops in Dallas, Utah, and Phoenix. And the Milwaukee Admirals welcome the Manitoba Moose to the Panther Arena tonight. And Saturday, it's Pet Fest at State Fair Park. You shouldn't bring your pets, but you should bring your wallet. Let's get this thing started with some Super Bowl silliness. The average aftermarket price for a ticket now is in the neighborhood of $20,000, with the best seats going for $47,000. America, what a country. After you buy those tickets and you have any money left, you might want to think about Valentine's Day. It'll be here in less than two weeks. Well, the Pet Adoption Center in South Jersey is running a special. They'll name a feral cat after your ex and then neuter it. I bet they thought that was funny when they first thought of it. <laughs> there are pet-friendly coffee shops and they usually cater to dogs and cats. Well, Tokyo has its first pig-friendly coffee cafe shop. The cafe is a free-range miniature pig, has free-range miniature pigs, as in more than one roaming the cafe. Would you like some pork rinds with your latte? And finally, imagine you've been partying with your friends for four days over New Year's. A 21-year-old Indiana college student thought someone hit him in the head with a rock the first night. But this kid was on a mission to party, and nothing was going to slow him down. On day four, he started to experience some arm spasms, so he went to the ER. They discovered a bullet fragment lodged in his brain. I don't think there's enough vodka in the world to get me that numb. On the podcast today, we have Adam Bailey, Mike Helsel, and wrapping up the week, here's Kyle Tedding. Well, thanks, Max, and a good week it was. The NASDAQ up 1.1% this week, closing at 15,629. The S&P 500 up 1.4%. That's up 68 points on the week, closing at 49.59. And the Dow Jones Industrial Average, a very strong week, adding 545 points, up 1.4% on the week to close at 38,655 for the year that NASDAQ up 4.2, the S&P up 4.2, and the Dow Jones Industrial Average up 2.9. You know, Adam, I think the easiest place to start this week may not be the best place to start this week, but um, I think any week the Fed is talking is always a place I want to dive into some of the comments. And in particular, you know, I think some of the market was betting on this idea that rate cuts were coming sooner rather than later. Jay Powell may be putting a little bit of a kibosh on that. Uh, dampening hopes of a March rate cut, um, but very much leaping o- leaving open the possibility that those rate cuts are still on the table for later this year. Yeah, Fed came out and said that uh, they're going to hold steady for now and uh, probably here for the next couple months. A slim chance that we get a rate decrease in March, especially with some of the economic news we got out this week, uh, especially in the job numbers. We'll get into that in a little bit. Um, but it's been solid economic news. And uh, is going to keep rates where they are for now. And we talked about this a few weeks ago, where the market was anticipating like six or seven rate decreases this year, and you can't get to that unless you start early, and they're not starting early. Uh, so the market is going to have to digest um, and change expectations because maybe we get one or two rate increase or decreases towards the end of this year. Um, I don't even know if that happens after some solid economic numbers. Uh, ask me next year and I'll tell you. Fair enough. Uh, hindsight's always twenty twenty. I guess. I think my favorite comment from, uh, from the Fed this week was uh, that they've made a lot of progress on inflation, but they just want to make sure that they get the job done. And I think that speaks to what really has been the mantra from the Fed from the very beginning, which is we think this inflation is going to go away. It may even go away on its own. Well, that didn't quite happen, um, but they remained committed to getting that job done. And so I think as I kind of navigate Fed speak, which is always kind of the, the thin line we try to walk, it is at least helpful to see that they remain data dependent. Yeah, and that they're doing their job. Uh, they, they really are. You look back at this past, uh, past year or so, they aggressively raised rates. And historically speaking, when the Federal Reserve has done that, they have 
historically upset the labor markets and push us into a recession, and that did not happen this time around. They were able to do the near impossible, raise rates aggressively, cool off an overheating economy without pushing us into a recession and without setting, uh, upsetting uh, the labor market. That was very impressive on their end. You know, Mike, Adam's been alluding to the labor market, and uh, you're somebody that's worked a few jobs in your life, um, but certainly... Some better than others. <laughs> certainly the uh, the data we saw this morning out of the labor market, the jobs numbers, um, I think surprising many, um, and of course adding 353,000 jobs in January. There's a lot of noise in that data, just given the seasonality of work. Um, and coming through the end of the year, but we also added a bunch of jobs in November and December. And, you know, normally we get that kind of surprise to the upside and the market falls apart. Good news becomes bad news. And perhaps today good news was actually good news. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, Adam mentioned the, a lot of people thinking about the March kind of rate cut. I mean, I never saw that as a possibility. And this just kind of confirms it, right? They're their mantra, as Adam said, you know, higher for longer, these job numbers, they support that. I mean, if you're getting 353,000 jobs, now obviously we'll see what happens with revisions. But you got, you know, even November, December revised upward. I was kind of surprised that the market traded like it did today because for the longest time it's been you get some bad news, the market goes up. You get some good news, the market goes down. So that was a bit of a shock to me. But for me, the biggest piece of the jobs number today was the wage growth number. I mean, you get 4.5% on an annualized basis. You couple that with finally consumers, consumer sentiment, I should say, feeling pretty good, or like at least the numbers are good and you're starting to see more anecdotal evidence that consumers are feeling pretty good about that. So if you have people that are feeling good about the economy and they're getting paid more, that is a sign to me that this market has some room to run a little bit. Uh, you know, to take this kind of back home and, and how this relates to people's investments uh, in the markets and the economy, it's consumers that drive 70% of our economy. So we, we tend to obsess over this. And the job numbers today was a real stunner. My goodness, uh, a week ago, consensus estimates were 185,000. And the number came in at 353,000, about double uh, what was anticipated. And Mike, to your point directly, wage gains four and a half percent, getting closer to five percent. And I, I don't want to sound like a, I'm beating a dead horse on this one, uh, but wages continue to rise faster than inflation. And that is one of the strongest underpinnings of uh, economic momentum. Wages definitely rising faster than inflation. And I think there's always going to be spin to these reports. There's always going to be folks that want to pick out data points and say, well, maybe it's not as strong or maybe it doesn't quite paint the story you say. I think you'll hear people point to hours worked down a little bit in this report, pointing to the underemployment rate coming up a little bit. But the reality is, as you both point out, wage growth is strong. People that want jobs can have jobs. The unemployment rate remains unchanged at 3.7 percent. And so I think as we look at kind of the economy broadly, it continues to be fair to say that we're on solid footing. You add in what we got with consumer confidence and consumer sentiment numbers this week, it's clear that consumers' expectations are for inflation to continue to slow, not to the 2% target that the Fed hopes, but still in that direction. And so I think as we look at the economic picture, well, what the Fed is saying continues to make sense. We're data dependent. We believe that we don't have to raise rates much more, and we'll cut rates if necessary. And so I think as we kind of think big picture about what that means for the economy, kind of the Goldilocks scenario is still intact. Um, the interesting thing is normally a week in which the Fed surprises a little bit by saying, hey, we're not going to cut in March. We get a economic data as strong as we got. We'd see those negative numbers. And in particular, Adam, growth stocks, the tech stocks tend to get hit pretty hard because they're so tied to our interest rate expectations but at the same time, a big week for earnings and some, some major news and some of the big tech names. And, and honestly, that's what you really want to see. You, you want to see in a week in which we get solid economic news and um, it's supported by some pretty robust earnings. And not just from the technology business, but across the board, there's some solid earnings numbers 
uh, technology businesses, uh, whether it be Apple or uh, Facebook's parent Meta, uh, across the board, there was some solid earnings. And that's what lifted stocks this week. And as, a, as an investor, as a long-term investor, you want to see fundamental news, things like interest rates and earnings driving the bus. And that's what happened this week. You know, when we talk about investing as opposed to trading, right, this idea that we are long-term thinkers, um, but we do look at markets day to day. And one of the things I like to look at is the heat map for what's making money or not making money today, this week, this month. And when the markets open this morning after that strong jobs report, basically one big green name on the board in Meta, uh, Meta, at, at least based on what we can tell so far, had the largest single market cap gain for any stock in the history of investing, um, adding something like uh, 20 plus billion dollars uh, to their uh, their main shareholders' wealth, um, and I think as we talk really through this idea that um, it is going to count on earnings to be the thing that drives the future, you know, it's clear that there are a small number of names that are really at the core of that that earnings uh, that earnings growth. You know, the other thing that I would mention here. Uh, Mike, is we're a month into 2024. I think so many looked at 2023 and thought, all right, perhaps we take a little bit of a step back to start the year. Some profit taking wouldn't be out of the question. And yet, you know, I think as you look across the board at key indicators, it's been a strong start to the year so far. A month in, we've got pretty good numbers on the board. Yeah. And as we've talked about during the show, it should be, right? I mean, economic news has been good. Earnings have been really good, so why shouldn't the market kind of push upwards? And especially, again, um, I've got a lot of questions. I know you guys touched on this in previous shows, but when we have the year we had last year and people are kind of getting back to the peaks that they had at the start of 2022, and now you're worried that the market's going to go back down, my counter to that always was, well, why? It's going to go up. It's going to get to where it was. Why can't it push farther, especially if the economy is doing well, if people have jobs? And then you get to the other conversation in terms of some of the stocks and earnings you guys were talking about, the technology piece. This technology, the technology, like the Magnificent Seven that we talked about, outside of Tesla, right, but like, some, like the six others, they are now so ingrained in our society that I don't see them like having this massive fall off, you know, out, okay, let me go back. Outside of 2022, when rates just skyrocketed historically, okay, you got me there. But you look at Amazon, uh, Google's a verb at this point, you know, Apple, they're all so ingrained in our society that yeah, they'll have their, their peaks and valleys, but they're not going anywhere. So you should feel comfortable that even though they've hit highs, there's a chance for them to go higher yet. Yeah, you know, I stole this word from a fund manager that we were talking to about some of these types of businesses. But, you know, these businesses that we want to own are those that are inevitable, right? Those that are going to be around simply because they are so ingrained in our lives that we have no choice but to buy their product to interact with them. In the case of something like Google, yeah, we're not really spending money on our search, but Google's certainly making money on that history. And so um, what you really want is businesses with cash, businesses with strong balance sheets, and most importantly, those businesses that are going to be here, for better or for worse, that are going to be here for the long haul. And so you know, I think it's one pretty meaningful reason why that Magnificent Seven, even if the names change a little from quarter to quarter, are as relevant as they are. You know, Mike, you touched on a topic, a conversation I had with a, a customer yesterday uh, essentially, should we be investing at an all-time high? And, and I think that's a very fair question uh, because we've reached, treat, uh, retraced previous highs. And we're on to new ones, and it's a fair question that so many investors are asking: Should you know? Should I be adding more at all-time highs? And the answer is yes. But I, I gave some more context and perspective to that. And you, you go back to you know the past 20, 30 years. All-time highs are far more common and less daunting than you thought you know, you, than you think they were since you know the modern era, like 1988 and beyond. Uh, the S&P 500 has averaged uh, about 20 new highs per year. That's about one and a half times a month. That's very regular, and 85% of the time that we reach a new high, the one-year forward returns are positive. 
my point is that you know strength begets strength, and uh, which in terms of a market often translates in the, into the formation of successive highs, and that's actually how we define a bull market, right? Higher highs and also higher lows. You know, I think that is always a tough sell with a forward PE on the S&P 500 at 20 and a half, and yet it is the absolute truth that you don't mind buying something at an all-time high if the expectation is that the price a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now is going to be an all-time high. And so, yeah, those higher highs are really the key to what we're doing here and buying those businesses that have the opportunity to continue to set records, not because we know that's where they're going to be tomorrow and not even necessarily because we think it's a great deal today, but because that's the exposure you want and this is the cost to get it. And so part of being an investor is saying, yeah, sometimes even when things are expensive, I'm going to stay invested because the opportunity cost, right, the, the, the cost of missing out on that deal is just too great. And so um, it's where we get away from this timing in the market and back to time in the market, because ultimately what you want is not just the cheapest stocks, but those stocks which you think are going to be worth more later. You know, I think a, a good place to end here is the S&P sets new highs uh, again this week as we deal with, uh, I think, some pretty meaningful records from some of those big seven uh, or the magnificent seven. Um, always a reminder that, um, you know, you're, you're more than welcome to tune in and share with your friends. We're happy to do the program for you. We enjoy doing it. And we will talk to you again next week. Thank you for listening to Money Talk with Bob Landis. If you have a financial question you want answered on next week's show, email it to moneytalk at landis.com. To keep informed throughout the week, visit our Money Talk page at landis.com. <laughs>